In our last chapter, Jesus shared a message that was weighty and likely hard for the disciples to digest. Yet he also told of his coming again in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. It's important for us as Christians to understand, while we are promised suffering in this life, we should be looking forward with expectancy to the glory that is to come. Colossians 3.4 says, When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Chapter 9 begins with an astonishing event in which Jesus would give a few of his disciples a peek behind the curtain to see his glory and a preview of the glory to come. This event is one we refer to as the Transfiguration. Jesus took Peter, James, and John up the mountain and was transfigured before them. The word is metamorpho, and it means to transform. We are told of his garments becoming radiant and exceedingly white. Matthew adds his face shone like the sun. This was a glimpse of the glory God's perfect servant had set aside in coming to this earth, the glory that was rightfully his and the glory we will know throughout eternity. In the transfiguration, the disciples observed Jesus speaking with Moses and Elijah. Luke tells us the conversation centered around what would be accomplished in Jerusalem. Why Moses and Elijah? Well, Moses represents the law and Elijah the prophets. And there they are talking with Jesus. Also, could it be that these two men illustrate God's people caught up to himself? Moses representing those who die and are caught up to glory. Well, Elijah provides a picture of those caught up to heaven without death as what we look forward to in the rapture. Peter didn't know what to say, so he blurted out, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't understand the mission of his Messiah. If it were up to Peter, they would camp out on that mountain as long as possible. God the Father interrupted, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. And with that, they were left alone with Jesus and then led back down the mountain where they would have the opportunity to watch him lead by example in embracing the cross before the crown. What a valuable experience this had to have been for those men who later on down the road would give their lives for the gospel. When facing the darkest of persecution, I'm confident they cherished this glimpse they were gifted of the glory to come. Coming down from the mountain, they encountered a desperate father who had brought his demon-possessed son to the disciples who were unable to help the boy. The father turned to Jesus and said, If you can do anything, take pity on us. Jesus called this man's attention to the word if and clarified by asking, If you can, all things are possible to him who believes. At this, the man declared his belief and asked for help with his unbelief. Jesus then commanded the spirit to come out of the boy and not to enter again. In verse 30, despite Jesus' intentionality to carefully prepare the disciples for his death and resurrection, they still didn't understand and for whatever reason were afraid to ask him about it. They did, however, find the time after entering Capernaum to discuss among themselves who was the greatest. Clearly they had misunderstood or forgotten about the mission of their master. Jesus called the twelve together and let them know, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. At that, he set a child before them, took him up in his arms, and told these status-seeking men, verse 37, Whoever receives one child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me but him who sent me. A simple act of kindness done in Jesus' name to the least appreciated of people is just as valuable in God's sight as ministering directly to him. Underlining this care for the little ones, in verse 42, Jesus issued a serious warning. It's my opinion, in speaking of little ones, he's not only referring to the young in age, but in faith as well. Jesus suggested it would be better for one who stumbles a little one if they would have a millstone hung around their neck and be tossed into the sea. Obviously, our Lord takes the care of his little ones very seriously. We close out the chapter with a charge for each of us to take our own sin seriously. It is much better for a person to deal with sin harshly in this life than in sin to be dealt the judgment of hell for eternity. In closing, as we have considered the seriousness of sin, let us be reminded that Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty and absorb the punishment for the sins of the world. With that in mind, let us take seriously and deal harshly with the sin our Savior paid such a high price to wash away. 
Thank you for watching this latest offering from Honeycomb Summaries. We pray these five-minute chapter overviews are a blessing and serve to help you grow closer to God. Please take time to go back through and read and study each chapter for yourself. If you're here and don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and aren't assured of the hope of heaven, please don't put off that important decision another day. For more information, search our channel for a video called Three Minutes That Could Change Your Life. Please share this video with anyone who might like to learn more about what God has to say in His Word. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel to be notified as new content is released. Thanks again for watching, and may the Lord richly bless you.